Beloved of our soul, enlighten us. Well, I can hardly believe that uh, this is the sixth annual <laughs> gathering here uh, for this spirituality journey. Uh, we have had a marvelous time at this. Uh, each time brings newness, each time brings new insight uh, and uh, new people. And as Maureen says, uh, we hope that we're all growing together so that we in turn can gather what, that they can take what we've learned here to give it to other people and bring it to our own situations wherever we are. Well, we, we, we reflected on what the theme was going to be here this year. Now, our overriding um, um, uh, uh, theme, as you heard, is come and wash in the pool of Siloam. So Maureen read that section from the Gospel according to John, where Jesus encounters the man born blind, and he puts a spittle and mud on his eyes, and then he says, go and wash. And we hope that that is really what happens each time we come together. Uh, and over the years, we've done different themes. We've done a theme on freedom. We've done a theme on a vocation and a call. Uh, we've done a theme on listening. And we've done several other themes, and I can't remember them all right now. But this year, as we uh, focused on what we were going to do, we said, well, let's go for the jugular. Let's go really for the essence of what the Center for Faith and Culture really stands for. What represents the mission as we see it for what we are trying to do, uh, not only for the university, uh, not, uh, but for the larger, uh, for the church, larger church, and beyond the larger church for the entire community in Houston. What is it we want to do and what is it we want to do best? And that is bring people together in dialogue. Now, the reason for this is that we are trying to reflect that uh, the best thing that can happen to us uh, is to learn that dialogue is at the very heart of what it means to be a human person. Now you think about that. Dialogue most fully represents who we are. Because it is in dialogue that we become aware of our capacity to respond to others and we become aware of the capacity to call each other out of ourselves. To take us out of our own little enclosed worlds so that we can be in relationship. Dialogue is the activity which most reflects our nature as relational beings. To be a human person fully alive means to be able to relate lovingly to each other. And the principal way that we do that as human beings, if we are not handicapped, in some way, physically and otherwise, is in the process of dialogue. When we say that Christians and the church participate in God's mission, the church doesn't have a mission. God has a mission. God, who for the Christian, is triune in one. We celebrated the Trinity yesterday. That this is a tri-unity, that there is one God and one God only whom we worship. But this God has revealed himself as relationship, and that within the very Godhead 
if God is love, there is implied that there are relationality within God himself or herself and the way that this God relates to the world in an ongoing dialogue. So the church has a responsibility and a mandate to help people to enter into this dialogue which takes place in the very Godhead itself. So there are three things that we're trying to do in the Center for Faith and Culture. One is to understand our way of life as human beings. The second thing is to understand what the gospel implies for the way that we live. And thirdly, in learning how to relate the two in a process of dialogue, we are learning what our responsibility is and our mission is and our, our ministry is to the world and that is to help people dialogue better. In his apostolic exhortation, Pope Paul VI, who was, who was Pope during the years that I was doing my university uh, higher studies in Rome, a great Pope, sometimes forgotten now, who led the church after the Second Vatican Council through one of the most difficult periods the church has ever experienced. But because of his own holiness and his insight and his equilibrium, helped the church do so without falling apart. This was a major sea change in the life of the church. And afterwards, he said, he wrote this apostolic exhortation in which he was encouraging people to enter into this process of evangelization, telling the good news. And what is the good news? The good news is that we are able to enter into relationship lovingly with each other because God, who is love, enables us to do so. We hear much said today about evangelization. Some people think of it as a technique. Some people think of it as a process. Some people think of it as cutesy little things. Other people think of it as memorizing scripture texts and spitting them out when the occasion uh, presents itself. Listen to what Paul VI says about evangelization. The purpose of evangelization is therefore precisely an interior change. Oh, and if it had to be expressed in one sentence, the best way of stating it would be to say that the church evangelizes when she seeks to convert solely through the divine power of the message that she proclaims. Now the divine power of the message that we are proclaiming is love. We have to be very clear about this. Evangelization implies no imposition. Evangelization implies no force Evangelization implies no coercion. Evangelization presumes freedom. The freedom of the ones speaking, the freedom of the ones receiving, the mutual freedom that they experience in their relationship. It presumes that love alone can, uh, can lead to this freedom. And in loving dialogue, we are able to communicate this freedom to others. So what is this conversion all about? Is it forced? Not at all. But we presume that by the power of love, people want to change. 
want to have things happen in their lives which is going to make them more fully human. That it is going to be that power, the power of the divine message of this love which speaks to this change of the person in becoming more fully human, both personal and collective consciences of people. So we're talking about something happening to me, but also happening to us in our understanding how to relate to each other and in relating to each other, what dialogue implies in that process of this change in becoming more fully human and more fully alive. Both the personal and collective consciences of people, the activities in which they, ga they engage, and the lives and concrete milieu which are theirs. So, the destination is to become more loving. To become more loving is to become more fully human. And to become more fully human, we must enter into dialogue. We cannot remain in our own little enclosed worlds. Dialogue is a process in which we find our authenticity as persons. And it flies in the face of those who would say that for me to be authentic, I have to go sit under a tree and navel gaze. You do not become human in your own little world. You can only become human to the extent that you enter into, I might say, the fray of dialogue, which makes demands upon us because it will test every virtue that we need in order to enter into that process. This is a spiritual discipline. It is learning. Disciplina, disciple, means to be a student, and that you are willing to enter into the school of dialogue in order to grow, to be formed, to, sh to be shaped, and to become who you are really meant to be. So much so that for the church and for Christians in Christian community, dialogue is the only way in the world. Let me repeat, dialogue is the only way in the world. For Catholics, we have the voice of Paul VI, who says this. We also have the voice of John Paul II, who in his very first encyclical, the Redeemer, the mission, the, 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 the Redeemer of the world, or Redeemer of humankind, says, you know what? Everything I know about how I'm going to be Pope, I learned from Paul VI. Because what he taught me is that the only way in the world for the church is through dialogue. No imposition, no fear, no coercion, but leading people to the difficult and yet exhilarating experience that one can have in dialogue. And all for what? All to achieve the one goal of Christ's ministry. And the one goal of Christ's ministry is, as he says in his priestly prayer in the 17th chapter of John, in the 17th chapter of John, may they all be one. And this oneness has many levels and works in concentric circles. It starts with an interior oneness where I feel myself to be integrated and I find all of my resources and all of my capacities, all of my faculties working together in a harmonized way so that it, that, that interior one must brings me to the peace that my heart longs for. 
May they all be one, Father, as you are in me and I am in you. In other words, we are invited to this same oneness interiorly and among ourselves as is in the life of the Godhead. Now this is amazing. This really challenges us. May they all be one. Myself, in myself, psychologically, humanly, spiritually, and in my relationships to one another. May they be one in society where we not only seek integration, but make the integration take place. Where all may be one in love and dialogue, where all have voice and where all have the capacity to participate in building a common life together. So this one has many layers of meaning. All of this can be seen in what the Catholic bishops called American Catholics to in their two letters before the most recent presidential elections. The titles of those letters are Faithful Citizen, Citizenship, one and two. Now this presents a great challenge to us presents a great challenge to us because what the, what the, at, the, at the conclusion of those letters, what the bishops basically say is this, we want you to be faithful citizens. We want you to be citizens who are full of faith. We want you to be people who can integrate both their life in a very pluralistic society with the belief that they hold. That in this, everything comes together and you are able to integrate and be a very faithful citizen, full citizen, in the participation in this way of life of Americans and at the same time bring to bear your deepest belief about love and dialogue as the only way to exist as human beings. It's a major challenge to us. Major challenge. And the bishops have put it there twice. Not that you live in a dichotomous way, whereas on the one hand you are a citizen and on the other hand you, uh, you are seeking to be a person of faith. That seven days a week you are living as a citizen and for 45 minutes to an hour you enter into a church on Sunday at which time you practice your faith. No. The, citizen, the, 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 the bishops are calling, calling us and challenging us to come together in such a way that in and through our faith, we baptize the culture. We immerse the culture in this loving dialogue with God. That we call people to the table so that in coming to the table and through the process of the dialogue, they experience the love of God, experience their dignity, are called forth and become aware that they do have voice in ways which will affect their way in community and seeking the common good. A major challenge. Absolutely major challenge. Do we do it well? Sometimes. Do we do it poorly? Thank God we at least do it poorly. Can we do it better? We can. But it takes a spiritual discipline. It takes a desire to enter into that dialogue, first of all. It takes attention, intentionality to enter into that destiny where we want to be one. And it takes great attentiveness on our part to the way we speak, to the way we interact, all of the dynamics that go on in the relationship between us and what this is going to do for us as a people in this country. St. Paul in Romans 12, 1 and 2, Romans 12, 1 and 2, says this. This is a very short passage, but I think this acts as a, as a kind of a key for us in the dynamics. Paul understood it. Paul got it. 
He's speaking to these Romans, and he says, I urge you then, brothers and sisters, remembering the mercies of God, how God's loving mercy has affected your life, how he has reinforced who you are and your dignity, has called you into community, and thereby made you a people. Remember those mercies of God, and now I ask you to make your whole life an act of worship. Not just formal moments of worship in liturgical prayer or in a church, but that your whole life, when he says bodies there, Paul means body, soul, unity, embodied spirits. Make that a living sacrifice to yourself, which implies this self-discipline that you have to have in order to enter into the dialogue and into this, this, this common effort of bringing community together. Dedicated and acceptable to God. That's the kind of worship for you as sensible people. And when Paul uses the word sensible, he means the, what, what is opposite to stupid. In fact, at one point in the Galatians, he says, you stupid Galatians. He actually calls them stupid. He gets so upset with them because they had forgotten what they were called to by way of living love in community. As sensible people. Well, how do you do this? Do not model your behavior on the contemporary world. A world which screams at each other and thinks that the louder you get, the more impact you're going to have. Do not model your behavior on the contemporary world, also which frightens people so much that they withdraw into themselves and are fearful of getting into this activity in which they will develop as persons. We have the two opposites there. Do not bottle your behavior on the contemporary world, but let the renewing of your minds transform you. The renewing of your minds about who you are, what you have the capacity to do, and how you, have, and, and, and how you are empowered, empowered to do it through this coming together in dialogue. Let the renewing of your minds transform you. That's the conversion that Paul VI is talking about when he's talking about evangelization. This turning upside down, this turning over, this turning around, so that you may discern, oh, what are you going to do in this, this dialogue, this process of dialogue? You are going to discern for yourselves what is the will of God. And the will of God is nothing more that, than this and it's contained in the one commandment of Christ that you love one another as I have loved you. To do that is to do the will of God. Is this the will of God for me? Uh -huh. Should I become a fireman? Should I become a professor? Should I become a father? Should I say celibate? Of which, in which of those are you going to become a more loving person? To do the will of God means to reflect who God is. Because if we are created in the image of God, we have something similar in us that we can do that will reflect God to the world. And that activity, as we're focusing on it here in this conference, in these three days, is to learn the art of dialogue to enter into that process whereby we will be shaped, we will be formed in and through the love that we experience, in and through making the sacrifices that are necessary to love in that relationship, and to discern for ourselves what love calls upon us to do in every relationship that we have. So, so that you may discern for yourselves. Discern means sifting out. Sifting out what is to be retained and what is let to fall to the ground. Sifting out for yourselves what is the will of God, how to love, how to dialogue, how to relate, what is good, what is acceptable, and mature. And mature for Paul 
has a wonderful meaning. He says, we are constantly on the path to maturing. Because it is only when we come face to face with God at the end, in union with God, that we are fully mature and fully alive. So Paul sees this as a process. Okay? And that's the first characteristic of dialogue that I would like to point out. It is a process in and through which the Spirit creates life and freedom. This is the other thing that Paul follows on. The Paul, Paul so insists on this, particularly in chapter 8 of the Romans. And I, I, I invite you to read chapter 8 of the Romans because that is called the theology of the Spirit. He can, it contain, the, 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 the chapter contains everything in there that we should know about the Spirit. Where the Spirit is, there is life. That's the first thing he says. And where the Spirit is, we are able to cry out, Abba, Father, which indicates that we are already in relationship with the divine and that the divine can speak to us and we can speak to the divine, which is the fundamental dialogue that we enter into because prayer in itself, prayer in itself is only a descriptive word for dialogue. Prayer which takes form and shape, not only when we say our private prayers, public prayers, but dialogue itself with other people becomes prayer, and it is at that moment that we are offering the worship of ourselves to God. To say dialogue is almost to describe what it means to be a Christian. It's a pretty good summary word. But what takes place in the dialogue when the spirit is at work is a new creation is being shown in life and in freedom. It presumes interior dispositions of spirit that are reflected in the exterior word and action in our life. What did I mean by this? When we think about the discipline, it means that we have to practice interior virtues, interior dispositions of the heart, which allow us to enter into the dialogue. That we have courage as opposed to fear, just for one. That when we want to back out, we find the power to enter in to the dialogue. When we want to recoil into ourselves and live a lie, we push ourselves out to find the truth. When we think that we don't have any words to be able to express ourselves, to let the Spirit speak through us, so that in speaking through us, we understand our oneness in the same God. So what this means is that we have to practice interior virtue, dispositions of heart, which are going to be reflected in the dialogue itself, in which we seek to build up the body, to build up the community, and to seek the common good. One of the most difficult things we have to do as Americans is to seek the common good. So what we're talking about here is not only dialogue between two people. We are talking about the dialogue of an entire society in which the spirit is working, whether people are Christians or they are not. The spirit of the Lord cannot be limited to the boundaries of any one given church. The spirit is working out there and we have to put our spirit in touch with that spirit to be able to discern and shake out what is good, true, and holy and mature. The dialogic process educates. 
It shapes and forms persons in the image of God and brings the image of God in them to its fullness. If it's dialogue, it seeks truth. If it does not seek truth, it is not dialogue. We have to keep that clear in mind. Dialogue of its nature seeks truth. And truth must be pursued in community and in relationship. I told you about us preparing this, these three days. We all think we have the truth in those little discussions that go on until we are reminded that we don't and that we have missed the point and something can be done better than we thought it should be done in our own little minds. It requires knowledge about where we come from and where we are going. This is really a critical uh, point here. We have to recognize that we have come from nothing. That in a particular moment, a creative act has brought us about. And we have to understand that we are nothing as we go to our demise and look for fulfillment in God himself. Those two balancing truths will always make us stand back and discern for ourselves in community what is good, what is holy, and what is mature. In dialogue, both the content and the style must be respected. You may have the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. And you may be so stupid about any kind of a style to be able to communicate that truth. Do you think you can communicate the truth by shooting somebody you don't agree with who performs abortions? That is certainly not in seeking the truth in a style that we have to do. It has to be a loving style which reflects the message of love that it is trying to communicate. It presumes discipleship. It presumes being students in an ongoing education, in the school of love, really. <coughs> Dialogue is the methodology of the school of love. And all of us need to participate in that to come to our fullness. And finally, it's not a quick fix. It is a slow and at times tedious process. It can become so difficult because at times we no longer understand what form, shape, or intensity the dialogue has to take. How do we speak our truth? How do we receive the truth from others? What is it going to mean to us to be able to move sometimes just by centimeters and not even by inches to come together? We can see this, oh, the most graphic example, of course, is what's happening in the Middle East. Will it ever come together? And how is dialogue meant to be carried out there? Next, Ben. So, what do we need along the way? Well, we know we're on a path. We know we're on a journey. And we're going to need light posts. That's why Father Ben has put this here as a kind of symbol for what we're looking for as we go along. We have this wonderful, I didn't even see this. I mean, I came in this morning. I was absolutely astounded to see this light post over here. Light posts for the Catholic come through church teaching. Jesus is ultimately the light. Church teaching only reflects the light. Church teaching is meant to keep us focused on Christ, who is the light, on this journey where we have to cross, make, where we have to meet many crossroads and determine which way we are going to go in order to get to our destination. There are many possibilities and there are many pitfalls. 
What happens is, of course, that some people like to hold on to the light posts and don't look for the light. And Karl Rahner, who is one of the great uh, theolo theologians, theological minds of the 20th century, said this, the dogmas of the church are light, like light posts. But the only people who hold on to light posts are drunks. Because they are so desirous of holding on to their security that they want to hold on to this. They're, they're full of fear. They can't understand that Christ, who is the like, frees up to be able to take the journey with all of its pitfalls and its possibilities to come to crossroads and know exactly how to negotiate that, to be with others in the negotiation and in the dialogue to keep on the path to come to the destination. So this becomes our symbol for the three days that we're together. We don't want to embrace and hold on to the light post. We want to recognize the candle represents Christ, and in Christ we find the light, the, 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 the light that we desire that is going to be able to give us the capacity to dialogue and to enter into that discipline. Okay, Ben? Let me see what else we have. Public discourse and the making of a people. We have to be faithful to the spirit. We collaborate in the recreation of each other. And when we are faithful to the spirit, we are faithful to the spirit who continues creating, but we have the responsibility for baptizing the culture. Now, you know, baptism. Sometimes we in the church even think of this as only a ritual. You know, it's so nice. The baby is born. We have to have the christening. We have to have the baptism. It's going to be so nice. Bring everybody together. We'll have a good meal after. Where are we going to go for the meal and so forth and so on? When in fact, baptism becomes the major symbol of the complete gift of being able to be immersed in the love of God and being immersed in that love of God to come out of that pool of water and recognize that we are given the capacity for new life and becoming fully alive as human beings. So the challenge today, the challenge this morning that I'm placing before you is to enter into this dialogue intentionally and with attention that in developing it and looking at it together as we go through these three days from different points of view, we'll go up with a commitment to be, pull, be, be truly people of dialogue because we want to be people of love. And to be people of love means to reflect, ver, reflect exactly who God is. God is love. And whoever dwells in God dwells in love and whoever dwells in love dwells in God. Okay, I think that uh, brings to conclusion my, my, oh yeah, mm, oh yeah, I found this hymn this morning, I was saying that saying the office, I love this hymn, and, and I, I do it in Italian, so I, I, I read the, my, my prayers in Italian, but I, I made this translation, it comes at the end of this hymn, it says, may Christ be our food, may Christ be our loving water, we may say, may Christ be our light, with sobriety, let us taste the inebriation of the Spirit. I love that phrase. With sobriety, may we taste the inebriation of the Spirit. So that the true drunkenness or the inebriation that we experience doesn't make us hold on to the light posts but truly gives us the sobriety to keep walking the line, even if we're stopped by the police, uh, if we're driving under the influence, and keep going and walking the line in such a way that we know that the only thing that will take us to our fullness and our destination is love, relationship, dialogue, and discipline. So I'd like to hear your comments. I'd like to hear your reactions. I'd like you to dialogue with me. 
thought that came up as you were talking about dialogue, and I'm thinking, is it just words, or how do we dialogue um, behavior? It, it has all of those, all of those dimensions. It is the words, but not only the words. The Germans have two words. They have the Sagen and the Aussagen, okay? The Sagen is what you say. The Aussagen is what comes out of you in the word. What stands behind the word? It means that you use words and you use them attentively and knowingly, and they carry the meaning of what is in your heart. We also have different kinds of dialogue going on and communication, and Maureen would be able to tell you more about that, about body language, about gestures, about symbols, and so forth. Yes? Father, what I got was um, that dialogue is love, and I think that so much of the time, I think too, we as Catholics, a lot of times are afraid to enter into dialogue because we think that's going to cause conflict, and we don't want conflict, and we don't want the anger and all of this can happen. And I also see it in relationship to those with addictions. You know, they sit, they tend to isolate, you know, and that's what causes a good bit of their problem because they go into isolation and they don't have the dialogue because of fear <coughs> of what's going to happen. So. Mm -hmm. What was your first thing you said? <coughs> that it's love. Oh, yeah. Well, you, you know, I, I, I participate in a lot of groups here in Houston uh, where you have to enter into dialogue. And um, in interreligious, for instance, either with the Muslims or the Jewish community. And you, uh, very often what you have happening in those is they like to talk about dialogue, but they don't like the dialogue. You get the picture? In other words, we'll talk about what dialogue is and we'll have a good discussion about what dialogue is. But if you start getting to places where there's a difference, people really get nervous and they don't want to go that route. Probably don't want to take the time that it takes. Probably won't want to go through that discipline of getting in touch with the feelings that are inside. Okay, yes. Yes. And to really encounter one another in dialogue and to find that communion, you have to be willing to risk intimacy. And in our culture, we have all these wonderful communication devices. And what they're doing is they're putting up walls and barriers and reducing our chances to really authentically meet one another. For example, I have teenage kids who text each other in the car when we're driving rather than talk face to face. You know, that's it's just one example. And they have all these friends on Facebook, and I, I ask, well, when do you ever get together and actually break bread with these people or shake hands or, you know, experience them in person? Well, we don't need to. We just text each other and we just Facebook each other, you know, or Twitter or whatever it is. And I hope you'll address some of the current trends in our culture that are impacting. Well, you'll help us to do that. Okay, but the, but the other thing, you know, a couple of weeks ago, I was in California, in Santa Barbara. I went out there for the birthday of one of my cousins, and uh, they run a school, a private school, and they asked me if I would talk to the students, and I thought, well, this is a private school. It's independent. It's uh, non-religious. Non There's no religious denomination behind it. They don't teach religion in the thing, and I thought, good God, what am I going to talk to these kids about, especially in California? Can you imagine? <laughs> so... So uh, I, I went in and I said, that's how I started. I said, you think you're connected. You have iPods, you have cell phones, you have text messaging, you have all these kind of things. Are you connected? And then from then I went on and I said some of the stuff that I'm saying to you this morning. Yeah, yes, yes, go with something, Jeff. Um, you were talking about on our own part to enter into dialogue, we need to be authentic. We need to be coming from love, and we need to have an integrated life in order to truly dialogue. What about 
those we dialogue with? Is it only possible to dialogue with those that are coming from that same authentic place? Is it beneficial to dialogue with those who aren't? You see what I'm saying? To choose the person we're going to dialogue with, how do we do that? I, I think we, we begin with a presumption that we are all imperfect and we're all broken. They're all making attempts at love. And we are all making, uh, as we make our attempts at love, we are making attempts at dialogue. It's a constant process of learning, and it's a constant process of becoming more aware of our own weaknesses as we enter into it. Uh, presuming the other person has the weaknesses and the brokenness, but nonetheless, and this is where we come to one of those wonderful gifts of the Holy Spirit, which we talk about, fortitude. Fortitude is being able to take the step into action even when everything tells us be afraid. And what would we be afraid of? We'd be afraid that we don't have our act together enough to be able to make a presentation. Or we're afraid because we figure the other person is so turned in on him or herself and be, is so broken that I don't know whether I can do this. Now, there are times that that's a prudential judgment. So you can discern for yourself, St. Paul says. I want you to be able to discern for yourself what's called for in this situation, for love, dialogue, and relationship. I, I, I'm going to jump the gun here, and I'm going to take some of Father Bin's uh, thunder. But there is, uh, there's this, 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 this situation in the Acts of the Apostles. You remember Paul and Barnabas were going around together? Finally, they said, Arrivederci. You go that way, and I'll go this way. Now, it was what, what I, uh, even from the point of view there, what happened in that particular dialogue? What happened there? What are the implications of what love demanded? And you know, in the Acts, Luke is very, Luke is very discreet. He just has one line. It's about, and, they, and they went away. And I, I go into that asking myself, what really went on between these two guys? These are both apostles, mind you. They're the ones who are sent, okay? And then some men came down from Judea and taught the brothers, unless you have yourself circumcised in the tradition of Moses, you cannot be saved. <laughs> I mean, who's in, who's out, all right? This led to disagreement. And after Paul and Barnabas had had a long argument with these men, it was decided that Paul and Barnabas and others of the church would go up to Jerusalem and discuss the question with the apostles and, 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 and the elders. But this isn't the place where they actually separate ways. Pardon me? It's at the end of 15, he tells me. Thank you very much. See, I need all this. Uh, I'm trying to look here. Oh, here it is. The party left and went down to Antioch where they summoned the whole community and delivered the letter. The community read it and were delighted with the encouragement it gave them. Judas and Silas, being themselves prophets, spoke for a long time, encouraging and strengthening the brothers. These two spent some time there, and then the brothers wished them peace, and they went back to those who had sent them. Paul and Barnabas, however, stayed on in Antioch, and there with many others they taught and proclaimed the good news, the word of the Lord. Still didn't find it. On, oh, here it is, yes. On a later occasion, Paul said to Barnabas, Let's go back and visit the brothers in all the towns where we preach the word of the Lord so that we can see how they are doing. Barnabas suggested taking John Mark, but Paul was not in favor of taking along the man who had deserted them in Pamphylia and had refused to share their work. Listen to this good community here going on. Okay. There was a sharp disagreement so that they parted company and Barnabas sailed off with Mark to Cyprus. Before Paul left, he chose Silas to accompany him and was commended by the brothers to the grace of God. Hmm? Pardon me? Mark was the troublemaker. Okay. So you see what's going on here. It's a question of relationships. Yes? But I think sometimes we don't allow each other to grow apart. Sometimes we need to grow independently. 
and then we come back together. Uh, I think uh, sometimes parents and children are that way. Parents, parents want to hover and they want to control, and they don't allow their children to, to go and grow. And then they come back, and, and I think Paul and Barnabas did come back. I, I think later they connected. Somehow I'm remembering that. But I think I think we think we always have to be together. We always have to, you know, be symbiotic. And that's not the case at all. Nor do you have to always agree. So, that's true. Mm. And sometimes you can go away and, and you, you debate, you think about it, your kids grow up, and they say, oh, my parents really were smart. <laughs> my parents really did know what they were talking about, and then you come back together. But, but sometimes we need an away time. We need a time to grow and, and to develop <coughs> our own techniques, our own style, our own person our own intelligence, and then we can come back together and dialogue. It's a, it's a, it's a human dynamic. We want to be close, but hmm, not too close. I, I, I need you very close to me, but don't get too near. I have to be here, and you have to be there. The other point I think that Don was bringing up before is, you know, you have to, dis you have to agree to disagree sometimes. You can't, you're not going to be able to resolve all these things. You aren't going to be able to do it. Yes? I think, though, you know, our society today is so easy, to, I mean, and so quick to say, oh, we're disagreeing. Okay, let's just get rid of this. You know, I see it in our corporation. Mm. I see it, you know, um, in our schools and everything. It's, it's like, well, you know, uh, you know, the perseverance isn't there to really establish that relationship or to really value, you know, that person. And so, on the other hand, I almost see, you know, everybody is almost so quick to hurry up and, and say, this isn't working. You know, let's just get rid of them because they were trouble. You know, and so it's almost hard to kind of find that, you know, that balance of knowing how, how long do you wait uh, and see, you know, whether or not this is good. Thank you, Sally. Very friends. In this last part of Romans where he talks about knowing what's good and acceptable and mature, perhaps Paul and Barnabas understood that the mature thing was not to stay, stay there and keep bickering with each other, and by that perhaps give scandal to the community. That's good. That's good. That's good insight. That's very good insight. Yes? Father, did you mention that uh, prayer is another form of, uh, dialogue is, is another form of prayer. <laughs> Maureen says something so beautiful. He said, we have to break open the word of God. We have to break open? The word that people communicate to us. Oh. I make a lot of uh, uh, kind of uh, respectful attentiveness, uh, a set of re re relevance for the gift of the other person. Doesn't matter that gift is wrapping whatever kind of, uh, of papers or or being presented in whatever style. And if we have that kind of prayer for continuing to see the beauty in the other person in spite of what is presented, uh, and I think that, I, I think I want you to, 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 to expand that on the concept of prayer because you're very good at that. I remember when I was studying with you, you said prayer is taking a long, loving look at the room. And, 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 and then different kind, different form of prayer. So how, how can you connect that uh, dialogue and shed light on the meaning of dialogue? Yes. Well, you know, St. Augustine wraps prayer up for me very fine in his letter to Prova, this person that he had written this, uh, this letter to. And in the letter to Prova, he says, don't think that many words are going to do this. You don't need a lot of words. You don't need a lot of words. Some people multiply these words multiplying words. He says, and that's nothing wrong with words. Nothing wrong, of course, with liturgical prayer. All of these are good, but basically underlying all prayer is the capacity to expand the heart to receive. He talks about the heart being the sack of the heart. And that we have this frightening capacity and responsibility 
to expand the sack to receive. What are you receiving? You're receiving what is communicated to you by God. And if this is true, and we presume that the Spirit is working out there, we have to be able to expand our heart to receive what is coming to us through a dialogic process and at the same time be able to sift it to know what we have to receive and what we have to let fall by the wayside. It's the essential dynamic of what I call active receptivity. Active receptivity for me summarizes what the spiritual life is all about. It also summarizes thereby what dialogue is all about because it also summarizes what love is all about and dialogue is only a form of love and loving being loved and loving it's that dynamic that's going on sometimes you're going to experience having to get away sometimes you want to be near but it is in that dynamic that we break open the words. The words are broken open. Maureen, you want to say some more about that? No. Okay. Yes. Uh, I've touched on three things. Uh, you mentioned something about baptism. And it's something that uh, is really beautiful, being immersed in the love of God. Sometimes we think of baptism as a uh, uh, prerequisite to enter into a dialogue because we we always thought that or we, we thought that baptism takes away original sin and then we enter into the church and we become full members of the church but by saying that uh, baptism immerses us in the love of God you already say that there's already a dialogue that's happening there so it doesn't Sometimes, you know, we, we fear uh, to enter into a dialogue, especially with God, because we feel that we still have the sin that prevents us from entering into a dialogue with God. But here, you already uh, express that God already enters in, into a dialogue with, with us, even though we are still in our sinful state. Another thing that uh, I uh, reflect upon is we're holding on to the lamppost Maybe because that's the only thing we've seen. We've only seen the reflection. We, we haven't seen Christ. We, that's the thing that was handed down to us, and we want to be true to it. We didn't, maybe we're holding on to the lamppost. The lamppost will not follow us or something. Uh, that, that's just a metaphor. Oh, please, please develop the, the metaphor. Yeah, that's, uh, you all have to develop the metaphor. It's beautiful. Uh -huh. um, maybe... We need to also be updated in the ways that others communicate and enter into a dialogue. Remember, Christ became man, you know, entered into our sphere so he could dialogue with us. So, you know, why don't we try to enter into the sphere of others so we can enter into a dialogue with them instead of thinking of these things as a barricade or and, and, and that's a good point to, 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 to also pursue, Father, because what we're talking about here is what we call the process of inculturation, which is really the po a culture, which is the process of incarnation, and it's in, in, in the process of the incarnation of love into this way of life. A culture is a way of life. And what we are meant to do and what, what the bishops had in their letter was that we should have a Catholic voice in the dialogue about the American way of life. Now that really presumes that we are dialoguing within the church to understand what is to be held and what is not to be held and at the same time to be able once having done that to go not only as individuals but as a community of dialogue to enter into a larger concentric circle of dialogue within the American way of life and have a voice there. And we're going to get into some of this. And we're going to see, uh, we're going to give you a practical 
uh, a practical uh, example and, uh, and, uh, and uh, exercise to see how you would do that, all right? Yes? But one element of that is something you mentioned earlier about our interior oneness, that, that we have to essentially have our act together to know what we are, what we think, what we feel before we can take that forward in group. Um, I heard a comment one time that uh, Mahatma Gandhi had given a several hour speech with no notes in front of him and someone was speaking to his assistant about being so amazed that he could do that and the assistant said what Gandhi thinks, what Gandhi feels, and what Gandhi does are one. Mm -hmm. So it was simple for him to do that because he was speaking from his center. I think a lot of us, especially in this modern age where we're going 90 miles an hour all day long and never stop to reflect on anything, it's hard for us to know what we are inside. So we can't take it forward. I th th that's a beautiful way of putting it. What he thinks, what he feels, and what he does, correct? Okay. You, you, you notice that th that is a perfect description of the asceticism of dialogue, the self-discipline of dialogue. And even though we may not have all those three together, we are still required. You can't just wait. You have to be aware of where they're not together, but still enter into the activity and then grow into that. Yes. Yeah. <coughs> I just think that one of the enormous challenges that we have, um, especially recognizing our culture, is this radical individualism that is rampant in our culture and is sort of the antithesis of dialogue. And so when you talk about baptizing the culture, it seems to me that is, that's the task. Mm -hmm. And, and I, you know, I don't want to be negative because I'm basically an optimist, but, but I think we have to recognize that this is what our culture presents to us. And it, not just this country's culture, but, but the culture, it's... Spreading out through, it's creeping, oh, it's creeping. Let, let's pursue this a minute because I think she's on to a very, very critical point. What American culture presumes, our way of life, how we look at the human person, is that we are individuals. We have to make it on our own. We have to have it all together. We have to have new age self-help. We read more some new, new age self-help books. We will make ourselves perfect. There was, a, there was a, you've all heard of the Pelagian heresy. It was an early a heresy in the church where people said it's by our will that we save ourselves. Nonsense. Salvation, which means coming together in unity and good relationships. That's what salvation is all about. Did you know that? It means that you're living together in good, un unified, loving relationships. When you're saved with God, you Everything is taken away, this, the original sin, all these things over here, which impede us, which distract us from that unity. You come together in unity because you learn it in community. The baptism of the culture takes place precisely because being immersed in the love of God, you are incorporated into a community. And the, 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 the questions asked at baptism are, do you renounce Satan? I do. Do you renounce all of his pomps and works? I do. And do you renounce all of these sinful things? I do. All right. And who are you asking? You're asking the parents and the godparents. And you're saying, now you have a responsibility because this is just the beginning over here. This is the initial immersion of this child or this person. Now, what are we going to do? How are we going to in involve them in the school of love, which will teach them relationships and dialogue? Well, it's going to be a long road to hoe, but we have the responsibility to do that. If you're an individual and you have to make it on your own, you don't need a community. It's as simple as that. That is so deeply rooted in the American psyche that when the Pope says, let me, let me just read you that other, other part over here in Evangelii Nunziandi, just to let you 
hear what he says here. He says, okay, we have to have this evangelize, evangelization going on. What are we evangelizing? The strata of humanity that have to be re, uh, uh, transformed. So for the church, it's not a question of just preaching the gospel to ever wider geographic areas, to a greater number of people, but of affecting and, as it were, upsetting through the love of the gospel, human criteria of judgment, determining values, points of interest, lines of thought, sources of inspiration, and models of life which are in contrast to the love of God that we learn in, in the gospel. That's a major thing that we have to dialogue here. And the bishops are telling us to be faithful citizens. Are you going to be able to carry the voice of your faith into this very pluralistic society and know how to dialogue with that? It's a contrast between a human person as a merely atomized being, little atom over here by itself, or as a person being essentially relational and finding fullness in community. There's the hub of the argument. And in our culture, it's all on me. Yes? It's encouraging to know, though, that uh, modern biology teaches us essentially the same thing, that humans are relational. One of the most astonishing, relatively recent discoveries in child development is that the dialogue between mother and a child from a very early age profoundly influences intellectual and moral development. The child does not unfold by itself. It unfolds in that relationship. And in fact, it's almost pre-human because there are certain things called mirror neurons, parts of the brain, that, that, that higher primates already show that kind of imitation behavior. And it, it's, it's amazing. When you have truth, it tends to be convergent. And I think from a totally different discipline from an entirely different mindset through behavioral observations and very careful studies. And then, but then there's the other interesting part, if you like, almost the nature of original sin, if you like, because most of the time, this relationship works perfectly. As the mother brings the spoon to the child's mouth, they open at the right time, and the, that spoon pops into the mouth, and the mother smiles. But there are experiments, uh, and in fact, more observations that show that sometimes the mother is inattentive, the child is fussy, the dance isn't perfect, and there are, you know, disagreements, kind of separations develop in a very microscopic way, and it's, it's studied with high-speed photography. So what is interesting is that a lot of the things that you are saying from a theological perspective and from a Christian perspective using revelation and history, biology teaches us the same things. We may talk about it in different language, but the two truths do tend to converge. Now, I don't want to then say, well, the church has the ultimate truth. That's not what I'm trying to say. It's simply encouraging to know that this concept of relational being is so deep. It is not that our genetics just unfolds. It is that relationship in microscopic ways. I find this very encouraging. Thank you, thank you, Doctor. Uh, you know, I, I watched that, uh, that series on the brain on PBS. <coughs> and, you know, one of the statements was, way, uh, was made that the brain is wired for relationships. The brain is wired for relationships. Oh, oh well, let's, let's look at this from the point of view of science. But there are these things, you know, which, uh, you know, the laws of nature tell us that. And, and uh, you know, when you violate that and what it does to the brain when you don't have the relationships, okay? Yes. And then that twisted out of shape and then you have another relationship later on at a higher level, which again leads to a mismatch. And you have a, a tree that sort of grows stilted in, in a... And, 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 and when it doesn't happen here in the brain, it goes someplace else to happen. Hmm. Oh, I, I, I don't want to go off on the brain. I'm no expert on that. Anybody else? Yes, Roy. One of the uh, sensitive issues in the city of Houston recently has been the uh, 
exploration and care in trying to excavate or look at the oldest black cemetery in Houston. To alleviate many of the problems, they have called in consultants from New York. The reason I did that, you might recall about three years ago, when they were getting ready to build a skyscraper in New York, and they needed a firmer foundation, they dug in and they found a cemetery of black slaves in New York City. And they went ahead and they examined the corpses of at least a dozen. But there are 11,000 that are buried in New York City in this black cemetery. In the ones that they did examine, they found distortion of the bones in the little boys, the, the children, because of the yokes that they used to use to carry the water from the river mm. back to the kitchens. A really a very interesting bit of history. But they're going back and talking to these consultants to try to get some idea how to resolve the problems with the Christian community, with the political communities, so that in Houston we'll have much less of a problem as we delve more into exploring what's going on right here in our own community. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to share that because it, it, you need that dialogue. If you want to go ahead and establish a good relationship within the, the community at large, you have to have that dialogue. It's a very practical application. It is. Very. Okay. How are we doing on time, Maureen? Good. Well, take, just about to take a break. Then. Okay. I just wanted to say one of the things that I hear when I listen to you that I always appreciate is that the, the image that comes to my mind with your message here is the reminder to me that dialogue is missionary activity in today's culture. Mm -hmm. and, and that you're moving forward in a land that seems hostile or uninterested in not just the message, but having a relationship. Um, and taking time for that. And I think that that was an important grounding that we wanted to have before we get into how scripture helps us be more on fire in that mission and how communication skills might help us go further. We first want to ground ourselves in the fact that this is our calling, this is our mission. And in American culture, at different points in history, this is truly missionary activity to be committed to dialogue. God has a mission to love the world entrusted to us to be representatives of that through dialogue to recreate a unity which has been terribly wounded and um, almost in some ways um, counterhuman in the activities that we have experienced. So it is God who wants to love the world to unity, giving us the capacity for a loving dialogue with the world. And that is very counter-cultural, very.